I think this team has a listening problem. Because in Sajib's speech, he talked about Thailand and the Philippines, but they were scrambling, so they ignored him. But anyway, it's all right. Let's talk about Western liberal democracies as well. We think our analysis applies. There are two questions. We want the answers in this debate. Number one, are there enough counterbalances to the exercise of this power you're granting to the executive? Number two, which policy is consistent with promoting justice? So they say, you know, the state is going to be careful about how it uses the, this tool, the executive, because there's public opinion that will rise up against it and people will protest. We said, protest cuts both ways. The fact that you can blackmail the state with the option of protest means it becomes an important tool in the hands of the rich as well. At most, even if the pardon isn't granted, there is a lot of destabilatory potential, right? And I said this in my speech because different groups will be trying to mobilize resources to angle for this option. Now, if this option wasn't there, that destabilatory potential wouldn't be there. They missed the more important part of the analysis and, of course, pick the weaker part. Next, debating 102 with Gemma, listen to the whip. Because Sadiq said, right? He said, elections are never going to be decided on who was pardoned. That's why your check and balance of elections don't hold water in this debate. That's really simplistic. I mean, it's so easy for the government to make electoral issues about other things. And it's therefore easy for them to just get away with pardoning friends or powerful people. Maybe one election that was decided on the basis of pardon. That makes no sense. That's why the check and balance is whole. And then they go, these are Western liberal democracies. The systems are intact and there are checks and balances. As if saying, Western liberal democracies is a magic wand that makes these systems okay. And I understand some of them are from Australia. They also elected Tony Abbott, right? <laughs> then Habib says, you know what? We agree. Rich people will always be structurally advantaged. What is the point? The point is, you are conceding that it's harder to convict them. You might want to magic wand your way out of this again by saying that let's address those things. Sure, but the law has to be responsive to social realities and what's going to be abused, how, it, how privileges and powers will be used, right? It's just, it's, it's just blind to that and tries to wash that away. Now, which policy is consistent with promoting justice? They're fixating on this plea bargaining idea, which Sadiq dealt with, right? We said that happens in a controlled trial process under the auspices of the judiciary. In that case, you are giving something in return. You're giving information, you're agreeing to plead guilty so you save everyone else the hassle and other things like that. In some cases, there is the consent of the victim. But you know what? Even if we give them that tiny thing, so what? You can't argue by example that because plea bargaining is allowed, therefore this must be allowed. Because this is another step, right? Another layer where potential inequality is exercised without the controls of rules of evidence, without the controls that exist in the judiciary system. Then they hide behind unjust laws. We said, if there are unjust laws, find that in the courts. Because the courts are going to resolve these legal questions and it's applied consistently. They said, marginalized groups like weak prisoners and things like that. In my speech, I asked, what is the likelihood that these prisoners will get the pardon? Do they have a hotline to the executive? What are the chances that it is these prisoners who are helped? There is silence on this side, except the argument that theoretically they can be helped. But again, we need to be conscious of social realities when we give the executive the power to overturn the decision of the judiciary, especially since there are other steps that could have been taken, like appeals, like appealing for a mitigating sentence at the end. We think this does deter victims. The fact that there are very few pardons does not prove the argument that pardon is not the first thing that comes to mind when deterring the victims, right? Obviously, it's a confluence of factors that deter the victims. But this is an important part of the confluence because it deprives them of access to hope. Those few high-profile cases, those few cases where rich people are convicted, they seem to poop with this point. Yes, conviction rates for rich people are much lower. I think this is fact. And they can see this in their first speech. So yes, there is still a net impact on the terrorists. That's something we have to account for when we decide the debate. We're proud to propose.